Jeff Weston returns this week, and we'll give you a chance to vote for whose pandemic-driven tech ideas are best. From Chromebook to 3D printers, Raspberry Pi game servers, to a Raspberry Pi camera embedded in a DMX light fixture. We'll catch up and see what we're up to. Plus, Becca's got your top news stories, including AI in orbit, Chrome extending your laptop battery life, and Sega's new retro gaming system. Our crypto correspondent Robert Koenig went to the Cardano Summit, but in today's world, the whole thing was virtual. He'll also share some standout highlights in the crypto news on this week's Crypto Corner. This is all coming up, so strap in. It's time for the tech. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players for local showtimes. Visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. My name is Robbie Ferguson, and joining me today is Jeff Weston. It's been so long. It's been a long time, man. Where have you been? I have been uh, at home avoiding the COVID. <laughs> <laughs> because the, it was it was here. It was it, no, it wasn't actually here. But no. yeah, it's been quite a time. Hasn't well, it? with so. all the social distancing and and whatnot, yep. you've got to you know you got to be careful and you know follow the rules. That's so, it. But yeah. now we're we're good. I mean, we can be we can be six feet apart. Yeah. And, uh, you and your family are well. Yeah, everybody's good. The kids survived. Um, Unexpected homeschool. Mm-hmm. Um, and how about the wife? Uh, she survived. Yeah. Skin of her teeth. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it was good. And now we're in summer mode. And uh, we're realizing because of how long we had this at-home school thing and mm-hmm. not going anywhere, not seeing anybody, you start to lose sense of time a little bit. And uh, our son today, because now we're in full-blown summer mode, he's like, is it Saturday yet? No, but it's, it's Wednesday. <laughs> oh. Sorry, kiddo. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, so whatever. I mean, it's all good. Mm-hmm. But this this scorcher of a heat wave we got going on right oh, now is my. nuts. Yeah. Here in Ontario, it's like, I don't know, what, 35 degrees out there. Anyway. At one point, my, my yeah. vehicle logged 39 today. 39. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's 39. Warm. That's Celsius, folks. Yeah. That's like. 175 Fahrenheit, I think. That's, that's like if co- you, you cooking egg. Math, you do the math, <laughs> math, Google it or something. Uh, hey, I want to give shout out to those um, who have been supporting our show. And in particular, we recently, as you know, Jeff, had a Kickstarter campaign. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we're going to have to very soon spell it cam pain. Oh, it'll be pain. Yeah. I'm actually yeah. looking forward now to that it, he's though. back. Now that he's back. We can finally go through with some of those perks. You know, it's a labor of love. <laughs> <laughs> a labor. See how we're, we're we're working the puns into this, eh? That's right. It's a. I don't know how to build a paintball into that one though. Yeah. No. We'll just ah, have to we'll take find a, a way. We'll have to take a shot at it. Some people have no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> That's right. Jeff is on the chopping block as far as okay. He's going to go through labor. He's going to get shot at with paintballs. Five hundred. Five hundred. Five hundred paintballs. Can you do that and survive? Yes. It's, wow. it's been done before. Yeah. So you're yeah. not that good. Uh, no, I'm, I'm great <laughs> at collecting paintballs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a big target. That just Pretty much. Running yeah. around. Shoot I, at me. I took one right on the Adam's apple a no. week before my wedding. Oh. And my wife, well, time fiance, not happy because <gasps> I had this nice wealth. And she's like, if that is there for the wedding, so help me. Wow. Day before it finally disappeared. <laughs> That's unreal, dude. Yeah. So thinking of our Kickstarter, uh, of course, this broadcast couldn't happen without the support of our community. Um, so I just want to give shouts out to BP9, uh, Scott Barkley, Ron Morissette, Jerry Kowalski, Jonathan Garby, Jens Nissen, Ameridroid, Noman5, Bill Marshall, 
and NICAD, uh, plus everyone else who's been supporting the show through our Patreon uh, or those who contributed directly to the Kickstarter campaign. And there's some folks that have, uh, that have trickled in after the fact as well to send in a check or a donation by some other means like uh, PayPal and things like that. So we appreciate you. Uh, we couldn't do this show without you. Um, as this is Jeff's first time back, I mean, that's a testament to like it's been such a process mm getting through this and we moved right in the middle of um the COVID 19 like right, shutdown. right at the beginning i think because like we were you were looking for a place when we went into the shutdown like yeah. the 20th of march whatever and it's like you were a week away from move day it's like right at the beginning it's like, oh. made it tough made it real tough <laughs> yeah but here we are, and, and it is a little bit makeshift tonight, and we're just kind of we're here to enjoy ourselves and enjoy having you here with us as well in our community. Do get into our Discord. Um, you can go to our website, category5.tv, and on that website, click on Interact, and you'll see the ability to, uh, to join us uh, in our Discord. Uh, we do have a giveaway coming up. Ooh, excellent. Yeah. Like and, uh, of course, uh, I love Maker Tech. I love tinkering and working with Raspberry Pi and, and various other single board computers. And so what better partner than Ameridroid mm -hmm. for a giveaway? So we are giving away a $25 gift card. That is US dollars, which is like 3000 Canadian. That's like I believe. my wages Again, for a year. Again, Google it. I don't know. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so $25 gift card for Ameridroid. All you have to do is send us an email contest at category5.tv. Let us know that you're watching and that you love Ameridroid and what you want to do with, uh, with that 25 bucks. It's going to go toward like a single board computer or maybe you want to grab a, a, some kind of, I don't know, you can do all kinds of stuff with these things. Oh man. Yeah. Lots. Let us know. Contest at Category5.tv will be announcing the date of that draw coming up as well. Before we jump into it, make sure you uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. LinuxTechShow.com will take you directly over to our Linux Tech Show YouTube channel. And uh, make sure you subscribe. Click that uh, bell as well. And that's going to make sure that you get the notifications every time we, are, uh, every time we post new videos. Well, Jeff, it has been so long. I thought this is an opportunity for us to just kind of sit, relax, catch up. Mm -hmm. But that's not good enough for TV. So we're going to have to gamify this to some degree. Of course. So this is the first ever the Category 5 Crew Conversations. That's what we're going to call this. So Jeff and I each have an opportunity to speak about two pieces of technology that we're interested in or that we've been working on through the pandemic, um, things that are, you know, exciting to us. Mm -hmm. And you get the chance to vote. So head on over to linuxtechshow.com, find these videos, and all you got to do is give us a thumbs up on the one or ones that you like the most. There's no limit to how many thumbs up. You could like them all if you want, um, but uh, we are not counting thumbs down. So just keep that in mind, and uh, you can vote as many times as you want. So get everybody together and cast your vote for which conversation is of the you you make the criteria. Which ones do you love? So the winner with the most upvotes gets a delicious bakery fresh cupcake. Ooh 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 ooh! I wish I had known the rules ahead of time. You have mm. an advantage. I would have like had mine in like Doctor Zeus type rhyme. <laughs> people people would vote just because of that yeah <laughs> so you're up first tell me uh, a, a bit of tech that you're interested in or something that's been exciting for you and let's let's chat about that yeah so um hmm, which one do i start with i you know what i guess i guess the first one i'll start with um is our son's graduation uh present so okay uh despite uh my youthful appearance i do have a son that is going into high school now which Makes me feel very old. That's unreal, eh? Yeah. Um, but uh, for his grad present, we decided we to get him a Chromebook. Cool. Yeah. So uh, we have never owned a Chromebook before. Lots of different computers and whatnot. But we needed to have something that allowed him the flexibility of applications, mm -hmm. but also the integration with the programs and the... Um, different infrastructure that the school board uses. Yeah. So we, and these days, if I may, like ev everything's going online, right? So exactly. Yeah. So we looked at, you know, we started with the, you know, 
really small budget of Amazon Fire tablets. Right. And we're like, yeah, this isn't really going to work. Mm-hmm. And then we started looking at, you know, we, we, we looked at the gamut. It's like, oh, there's, you know, $6,000 for a, a MacBook Pro. It's like, I'm not doing that for, mm-hmm. for a grade nine. And so we settled on this uh, Chromebook from uh, Asus. And it's one of the only ones on the market right now that uh, converts to a tablet. That's so cool. you flip it over mm-hmm. and you have full 13 um, inch tablet mode. So is it touch screen like with your finger? It is a touch screen ah, with, cool. with Gorilla Glass. Yeah. Um, and he absolutely loves it. And so because it is, um, it is the Chromebook, you have access to the Google Play Store. And so mm-hmm. all of his apps that he's used through Google Play on his phones, he has access to. But also because of that, it integrates with what the school board does through the Google Docs and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's really, uh, it was quite a cost-effective option for uh, a young child. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I don't know if I can call him a child anymore. He's now a teenager. Yeah. But, but for, uh, you know, somebody who's learning technology, the responsibility of being um, you know, on their own device, but in a way that is safe. Mm-hmm. And so that was one of the key components is we needed something that was safe. That wasn't going to be, you know, I didn't want to have to worry about a ton of viruses and stuff like that. And obviously you have to be smart, smart with apps and the app store and what you mm-hmm. download. Um, but it's, a, it was, but it's a really good way, uh, for getting him into the market yeah. and we understand it. Uh, he was a little bit bummed that Chromebooks do not run Minecraft, but, um, <laughs> that's all right. I want him to be doing school, not Minecraft. Yeah, it's an interesting shift in the paradigm, though, isn't it? Yeah. Because now it's not like the old days. Oh, to call it the old days. <laughs> you don't know, right? you don't buy like a CD and right. pop it in the optical drive and install the program. You you basically you, it's like a phone. You go mm-hmm. through the app store and pick the apps that you want. I'm sure he'll find other apps. And you can't install like a. I, I mean, this is off off the cuff, but can you install like an Android version of, of Minecraft? Like does such a thing? Um, so he can, it's, it has to do with the, uh, architecture within, um, how it, it, uh, the like Chromebook the processor, is. the SOC. No, no. Like the, um, like the, the programming architecture. So it's mm-hmm. not because, um, Minecraft is Java based. The Chromebooks don't have Java. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Total shift in the way things work, and it's yeah. interesting that that like the, with the education system going to this like work online, and we're communicating now with like Google Meet. I guess mm-hmm. it's called, is it? Yep, Google Meet, Zoom, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, right. So, so all of those work, which is great. I mean, yeah. really, the only limitation we found so far was Minecraft. I'm like, if that's, that's the, crazy, that's the biggest worry you've got. Then yeah. we did all right. And so uh, it's funny. We a couple days ago we were at. Um, we went to Staples, mm-hmm. and so they've got all their different devices out on display. And he went looking for his because he's like, he wanted to know how much it was. And, oh yes, you know, yeah. didn't want to tell him. But he started looking at other devices. He's like, this one's really expensive, and it doesn't look as nice as mine. And this mm-hmm. one's expensive; mm-hmm. it doesn't look as nice as mine. And he's like, wow, you guys did all right. Way to go, mom and dad. <laughs> and I'm like, nice. Dad win. <laughs> and Jen was part of it. I, dad I have, win. <laughs> he, now he's so he's presumably 13. Yes, he'll be okay. 14 in November. All right, so. Like with my kids, um, two of them are under 13. So their Google account is provided by the education system. So I have this fear with if they started using a Chromebook that when they graduate, the education system might shut down their account and they'd lose like their files and everything else. Like do we... So I would presume because he's 13 and you've got to be 13 plus that he's created his own Google account. Yes. Yeah. And we... So we... We created the account for him. We, uh, I still retain the ownership of it, so to speak. Like he doesn't okay. even have the like pa- the parent mode. That's right. Cool. So he doesn't have the password and stuff, and and that is for the purpose of a safe monitoring. Yeah, I can. Uh, it tells me when he signs up for something. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have reports on how he uses his device that goes to his email, so he can start to learn now what his usage statistics mm-hmm. are. Um, and some might, some might think that that sounds a little big brotherish, but I think as a father, like, it's really important that we, uh, that we help keep our kids accountable and, and keep them safe because there's so much nasty stuff out there right now oh, so. and not just like, and there's malware. I mean, we're hearing oh, about malware in the, in the play store and stuff that's yeah. spying on things and, and clipboards that get uploaded to various servers and things like that. So, yeah. so it can be scary. Yeah. But what the, the nice thing is because it's a, a 
relatively safe device. Yeah. And because of that um, parental input yeah. with having the email and whatnot, I can teach him how to safely use his computer. Cool. I can, uh, you know, and I've taught him uh, how to access, um, you know, like all of his cross Google, uh, you know, his extensions, his history, all that kind of stuff, oh, because yeah. it syncs it up. And yeah. so he's like, oh, right. Because as soon as, so he's done something on his Chromebook. And then he can log into Chrome on the family computer That's and suddenly correct. he's got access to all of his things. That's right. So I'm, I'm starting to teach him in a safe environment that, you know, sync nature and the back yeah. and forth compatibility. And, and it's, it's really fun as a dad being able to watch my son go to the next level. And it's not just like, you know, when I was a kid and it's like you get a computer and you just do things for the yeah. sake of learning. It's like, I'm actually working him through it so that he understands it has a better, um, more mature outlook on what he can do and what he should do and cool. shouldn't do. And it's, uh, it's good. It's Excellent. Good. Yeah. Sounds like a great gift. So that's, that's my story. It's not shiny. It's not uh, impressive, but it's parenting 101. There you go. Very good. What about you? Well, my first bit of tech that I'm curious about right now, and it's not something that I have or can really get started with, is 3D printing. Ah, yes. See, 3D printers to me have for the longest time been this kind of untouchable tech. Mm -hmm. And I've looked at them and I've kind of kept an eye on them and, and wondered about them, but it seems so sci-fi to an old school tech guy like me to be able to yeah. 3D print tools and 3D print things. It just sounds like something out of sci-fi from yeah. when we were kids. But it's a real tech now. Mm -hmm. And the price has come way down, way down to the point of unreasonable. And I'll talk about that a little bit. But what really has pushed me over the top is seeing how some of my friends who are into 3D printing technology are able to do just that, come up with an idea and realize it and manufacture it. Yep. And a perfect example is right here at the studio. Now, Jeff, you can see, those at home can't see, but I've got all the wires just going into a piece of PVC or yes. a piece of pipe. Yep. And it goes through a hole in the wall and it's incredibly makeshift and it's terrible. Right. So I started talking uh, with, with Bo Lucknowski from Ameridroid because yep. I knew that Bo does 3D printing and he's into that kind of thing. And he's he, like my go-to guy. And, and he takes the time to, to chat with me about it. And I appreciate that. And I said, like, what could I do with this situation where I've got a, a, a wall that's like this thick and it's just drywall and I've drilled a hole in it, but now I've got a piece of pipe going through and it looks terrible and it's not, it, it totally looks makeshift. Right. And I can't get a contractor in to, to build something. And if I did, it's going to cost Two hundred dollars, if not more, just to have a proper conduit put right. in, which is crazy when you think about that. It's it's a lot of money, and so Bo and I got talking about it and 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 working on some ideas and kind of back and forth, and he came up with a design for something that he's calling Easy Portal, and this is basically if you can picture two pieces of pipe that are each about this long, and they screw into one another. Okay. But they have a flange on both sides. So with, and he designed this and he's actually printed one and I'm, and I'm hoping to receive one soon. I think it's in the mail, but you put one piece on one side, one piece on the other side. And, you know, I guess I'll get somebody on the other side to twist on that side. Right. And you twist it together and it screws in together and it sits flush and it's tight and it's a perfect conduit with a nice little flange. Wow. Beautiful. So he calls it Easy Portal. You can actually see it on Ameridroid.com and uh, mm. just do a quick search for Easy Portal. And, and that to me, Jeff, made me think, okay, so if I just, if I could do that instead of paying $200 to a contractor to build a proper portal, something through the wall, that starts to make a little bit of sense, but right. it's still beyond me. It's still well beyond me. Now he, he would have more of a a robust 3D printer. It wouldn't be like a little tabletop unit, right? Well, I don't know. I mean, I asked him what kind of printers he's using and he's got an Ender 3. Oh, okay. He's got, um, you know, the, the standard kind of, you know, what we would call a consumer 3D printer. And he's yeah. got 
Uh, he's got some that are a little higher end as well. Hmm. A little higher end. <laughs> well, I was like, no, it's way higher end. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm still learning the industry. It prints but... human beings. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and that's coming. <laughs> well, we can 3D print body parts now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here, here's where my thought processes go, Jeff, is I start to look at this wall, and, and so we need to get the signage done. Right. And so I've got a sign person who's telling me $300 to do the sign. So you can think you can 3D print the Cat5 logo. I start to think that. I start to think, okay, could I? And then you start to look at 3D printers and you realize that, you know, for $500, you can get a high end, like a decent consumer right. 3D printer. And that's on the high end. You can get them for 300. That's true. I keep looking at them on yeah. different online portals like Amazon and whatnot. And uh, it's on my frivolous spending list. Because yes, I, that's me too. Uh, to me, a th like a 3D printer, I don't think I have a legitimate need for at home. Exactly. But at the same time, I've thought about getting a 3D printer for the sake of printing Lego pieces. Mm. I don't know if that's even a copyright thing. But, Probably. But a lot of times... <laughs> my, I've seen them on Thingiverse. Uh, yeah, I mean, my, but like every once in a while, my kids will break a brick. Okay. And it's like, oh. And they cost a lot of money. <laughs> it's insane. And I'm like, if I could just print that, that, you know. That's a pretty basic use case. But for me, I'm thinking like, can I offset expense mm. by printing something myself? Can I justify the expense of a 3D printer and learn and the time that it takes to learn how to do it in such a way that I'm actually saving money? I the, you, the signage yeah. starts to make it look that way. I bet you, you probably could. And now, okay, for the life of me, I'm blanking on the name of the unit, but there's a, a, a tabletop 3D printer that I was looking at. There are so many, Jeff. A These week, days, there week are so ago. many. But not only is it a 3D printer, mm -hmm. it's also a laser engraver. Yeah, yeah, I've seen those. <laughs> and there was something else it did. And now was, you're getting serious. And I was like... But aren't those thousands? It was It was 29 Yeah. It was yeah. $29.99. So, and I was like... Oh, I could come up with something for that. <laughs> so maybe what I what I would look at then in that case is I would say, okay, would would I start with something that's three hundred, and and see how I do and see if I can offset cost, which is virtually making money, and or, then and then upgrade if I need to or if I can justify that. Or I think you should just say, hey, if somebody buys you that unit, you'll go through labor with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Robbie's like, shh, quiet. Shh. Yeah. No, that's all on you, Jeff. That's right. Um, I, I looked at uh, a one U um, mounting system uh, because I want to rack mount some single board computers. Right. And you're looking a couple hundred bucks yeah. for a little server case to be able to put my single board computers on the server rack. And then I got onto Thingiverse and I started looking and, and I could print one. Mm -hmm. And so my approach has been, so I haven't bought a 3D printer. I don't have one, but I decided, okay, I'm going to see if, because this is, this is what I fall into. I'll buy things thinking that, oh yeah, I'm going to use that. I'm going to, it's going to offset my cost and blah, blah, blah. But then I find that the learning curve is too high. So yes. what I've been doing is I've been going onto Tinkercad.com and I've been doing my first designs. Oh, okay. And so I actually have four designs already up, including the Category 5 logo. Oh, nice. Okay. On, on my, uh, I've got a Thingiverse account, Bald Nerd. Mm -hmm. So you can see the designs, including a little case for a Raspberry Pi to be able to mount it on mm -hmm. my one, uh, 1U server rack, 19-inch server rack. So, so I'm doing the designs first to see how, mu how onerous it is. Right. Figure out, can I, can I actually do this? And then I can start to look at, okay, if the sign is going to be 300, how much would it cost to print? Does it have that kind of um, uh, estimator online when you come up yeah. with the design? Yeah. You okay. Can, in, in, uh, in the software, you can, you can actually see uh, how long it's going to take and how much, uh, how much uh, filament it's going to use. Hmm. So there are, are all those things. So uh, I'm starting to look at that, and I'm really, really curious. And I, I'd love to know what you think. And, and you know, is there... A really va like, are we at that point where the price has come down far enough on 3D printers that it now makes sense to have one right. in, you know, in the home, in the in the office, because you can do stuff now that is like when I have ideas, you can just 3D print them. Right. 
I have ideas. Oh, uh, I have I ideas. Can be 3D printed, though. Comment below. What ideas do you have? And what do you think? We've got to take a really quick break. When we come back, we've got more of our conversations right after this. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and this week it is the Category 5 Crew Conversations. It's me and Jeff, and we are chatting it up about various techs that have us excited. So, Jeff, you're next. All right. So, uh, I know we've already covered two topics. I already think you're one up on me. That was a pretty cool 3D printing, by the way. Uh, okay. So, my other tech thing is in relation a little bit to what my first topic was uh, with the Chromebook, but uh, the lack of access to Minecraft. Oh, yeah. So one of the tech that uh, I'm, I'm looking at right now, actually in the middle of at home, is um, we've done away with our paid Minecraft server that we logged into that the kids had access to and you know like when i was traveling for work yeah i'd be in a hotel room we'd log into the server together and i'd be on the phone with my kid and you know for like an hour while i'm at home or while they're at home and i'm i'm in the hotel we could play minecraft together just that oh, little cool. way of connecting yeah. remotely but uh, i'm using a raspberry pi to set up my own at home dual minecraft server uh one for uh access through our pcs yeah. and one for Pocket Edition. So the server is running the software for both. And once it's set up, no matter where we are, we'll be able to log into our home Minecraft server. Nice. And have our own world and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that way the kids have full access to it. They can have, you know, give the login to their friends. It'll be behind the security features of our network. So it's safe and secure that way. Um, but so also, you get to select who joins the that's server. Correct. Yeah. But also because it has the ability to do the pocket edition server, uh, it means that on their phones, they can also stay connected oh, as well. Oh, nice. So now, so that's what I'm working on at home. The, the software is installed. I'm just configuring it. Yeah. I wasn't sure how it would run on the Raspberry Pi because that's what, that's immediately what's coming to mind. Cause I'm like, okay, Raspberry Pi, unless you've got a four, nope. you're dealing with one gig nope. of it's, RAM. It's a, it's a three B plus. Um, okay. and I thought for sure it would be laggy, Yeah, but it's not. What about world gen? Uh, so if you fly across the world, is it, is it, well, I haven't to... got, I haven't gotten that far yet. Okay. So, um, it, like I'm just, I'm working through the process of setting it up, but as far as yeah. running it on the, on the pie, uh -huh. it runs okay. There doesn't seem to be any server lag uh, cool. with one of us joining. Yep. Uh, it'll be, you know, the, the true mm. test will be when we add four, five, six people, people oh, yes. remotely logging oh, in. Yes. We'll see how it goes. But I was going to do it with uh, my Odroid. Yeah. Um, that was an XU4. Yeah. 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 But uh, I decided to give it a try with the Raspberry Pi just because of the the power usage. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a little bit lower and, and I had an extra pie kicking around. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's the project that I'm working on right now. And, and, and if it works and it runs well, um, then maybe we'll do it as a feature for the show. That'd be awesome. So Pi 3B plus is limited to one gig of Ram yes. versus an XU4, which has two gigs of Ram. Right. The 3B plus also is limited to an SD card, which right. is shared on the USB bus. Correct. So it's a little bit slow. Yeah. Um, Whereas the XU4 has EMMC. Yes. So I think if you have like a latent, like not latency, but issues with world gen, I think maybe the XU4 might help oh, for sure. solve that. But also, um, if you wanted to upgrade to a Pi 4, you can get up to eight gigs of RAM. I thought about that. Yeah. See, I just had my birthday last week. And the great thing about being not a kid anymore when it comes to birthdays is people are like, I don't know what to give you. I just gave you cash. So ah. it's like, I've got all this cash okay. and they're right. like, use it for something you want. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> computer. <laughs> you want to know what's interesting though, in along those lines, like there's so much work to set it up and get it working. Well, the people that created, um, I always have trouble with it. Belena Etcher. Mm -hmm. Belena. Yep. So the tool that we use to, to image our SD cards and yes. the EMMC. Great program, by the way. Yeah. Uh, they also have. Balena Minecraft. What? 
Yeah. So they've created an image which is available through their GitHub. And uh, I'll post the links below. But with Balena Minecraft, they've optimized it to, to run as well as can be. Oh. As, now, this as a is Minecraft, like Minecraft server Minecraft for or Raspberry Pi. It's a server for Raspberry Pi. Now, oh. but they do warn that one gig of RAM, you're going to have trouble. Yeah. And I think that's what you'll encounter because the, the, the fear that I have with a 3B plus is the minimum system requirements for Minecraft as a server is one gig. Right. Well, if you only have one gig, where's the overhead for your operating system Correct. and everything else that's running, right? So that's where the, the Pi 4 comes in with eight gigs of RAM. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, I wanted to try it on the Raspberry Love Pi to see idea. if it worked. But uh, if it doesn't work out, then I'll go to the XU4 and maybe I'll spend that birthday money on Just the, maybe, the eh? Pi 4. And then get an Argon 1. Yeah, man. I'm telling you. It's That'd be awesome. It's like the possibilities are endless. It's good. What do you guys think? Give him a thumbs up, will ya? All Is right. it my turn? It's your turn. Let's see if you can bring this home for a clear, solid win. Do you guys notice these lights behind us? Yes. See well, this? they don't see the lights, but they see probably the little Right. Glow. So you see the glow behind me right. and the glow behind Jeff? There. Those <laughs> are DMX lights. Not the wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> What's neat about... So I've got, we've got LED lights all around us here at the studio to, to illuminate us. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, you can see them. Yep. Um, and they just plug in, you turn them on. And they're significantly smaller in size than the bulb oh, yeah. lights we oh, had at the other man. studio. Yeah, now we've got all these soft boxes that i got to sell because, like, what do you do with them when you've got all these nice little LEDs? Right. But the LED panels that we use are, are just plug and play. You plug in the power and turn it on. Mm -hmm. DMX, on the other hand, gives us a whole new realm for lighting in that you can control all of the lights from a controller. Okay. And when I say a controller, so these lights behind us are actually running through. Oh my goodness. What appears like a mixer. Yeah. Right? So like I can. Ooh, strobe. Yeah. Do, do all kinds of changes. We can, I can change the color. Ah, so these are the, okay. this is the RG. Oh, that's the brightness. And then I've got red, green, blue. Yep. So I can actually change that. I got a bit of a purple going on. So this is pretty neat. But again, this is one of those technologies that I always thought it would be ultra expensive, but it was oh, pretty cheap. So yeah, they are very cheap. So, but that blew my mind because I needed to buy two lights for the studio. Well, this with eight lights was cheaper than those two lights. Right. That didn't make any sense to me. So then I, but then I started doing research and again, I start looking at how, uh, what can I do that's kind of like tinker and, and have fun. And I started looking at the other lights that I have and well, they are not DMX compatible. Oh, however, you can buy a little controller that takes the power and then takes DMX input and then connects oh. to any of the standard LEDs. Or if you want to do uh, like okay. light tracks with the, with, you know, the spool of light cable, LED oh. cable. So <laughs> pardon me. That's all possible. But then, so again, I'm looking at, okay, well, you know, how can I, what else can I do with this? Is it worth getting? Mm -hmm. There are DMX lights that you've probably seen them that have a pan and tilt feature. Yes. So you've probably seen them at dances and everything else. Yeah. And with these lights, you can move the light around using that controller. Oh, okay. Then I got looking at, at a particular very, very cheap one and realize that there are screws to remove the faceplate. Why? For service, presumably. Okay. Remember when I said, I'm look, look, thinking about ways that I could use a 3D printer to do cool things that would save money. Are you going to make a bat symbol? No. Tell think, me. think about a pan tilt zoom camera for $2,000. Yeah, okay. Then think about a pan and tilt light that's controlled by this controller for only $90. Okay. Take the faceplate off, put a Raspberry Pi inside of it with the Raspberry Pi HQ camera. 3D print a new faceplate to hold that in place. Oh. Now you've got a DMX controlled Raspberry Pi HQ camera. 
which we, we would be able to hang on the ceiling. We'd be able to control for uh, doing product reviews and overhead shots, which we can't currently do. Right. Because we don't have that capability. And a PTZ camera is 2000 bucks. I like that. I so, still think you should print a bat symbol for me. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing stopping us from doing that, Jeff. There we go. Yeah. So with, with that controller, you can control as many, like it, it'll do, it has 196 channels. So hmm. you can control as many lights and, and pan tilt systems as you want from that controller. Basically, virtually no limit for a small studio like ours. I wonder if, and I'm just thinking from a pure like security standpoint, mm -hmm. If you could use that housing to also hold like a, a wise cam so that you've got your cameras inside yeah. the lights. Have multiple cameras? Yeah. So there's not, no reason why not. That way you can have your PTZ security as well going on. Yeah. Sure. Move it around. Well, or you could just buy a PTZ wise cam. But in Fair particular, but in this particular, is fun. now you could use a 3D yes. printer. <laughs> in particular, the HQ cam for the Raspberry Pi is like a full quality camera. Yeah. So I can install software on there to turn it into uh, an HD camera for our show. Very cool. That's something that has me kind of excited. Hmm. hmm. It's just a thought. It's just an idea. I, again, I don't own a 3D printer, so I can't, but I can start designing the, yeah. the idea, crafting the idea, and maybe have somebody else print the design for me if it works. Just an idea. What do you guys think? Is that something that sounds fun? I, hey, I'm, yep. And then all of our lights in here, in the studio here are going to be controlled by the, the, the DMX. Did I say DMZ? I might have said DMZ a couple no, times. I think I said Did DMX. I say DMX? Yeah. Okay. There's so many acronyms going through <laughs> my head right now. <laughs> Very cool. Well, this has been fun. This is, you know, just kind of having fun catching up. And, and it's been, a, I haven't actually seen you since April. Yeah, since, well, since the move. Yeah. I, I think that was last time. So that would have been at end of March. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. that's right. It's it was move long day. Long time. Wow. Well, nice having you back. Mm -hmm. We do have to head over to the newsroom, though, so we've got to relinquish the floor yes, to true. Becca. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. ARM plans to spin off its IoT businesses under the SoftBank banner as it focuses on core chip design business. Autonomous driving startup turns its AI expertise to space for automated satellite operation. A new Chrome experiment may boost your laptop or device battery life by up to 28%. User profiles along with parental controls are finally available for Amazon Prime Video. And Sega's next retro, hard retro hardware is a 1-6 scale multi-game arcade cabinet. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. ARM has announced plans to spin off its two IoT businesses, a move that would effectively transfer the divisions under the broader umbrella of the SoftBank Group, which purchased the chip designer back in 2016. The move comes as ARM seeks to, to focus its efforts exclusively on the semiconductor business that has made the company a ubiquitous presence in the mobile world. The transfer is pending additional review from the company's board, along with standard regulatory reviews, though ARM says it expects the move to be completed before the end of September of this year. While it would effectively remove the IoT platform and treasure data businesses from its brand, the company says it plans to continue to collaborate with the businesses. The company will retain the chip aspect of IoT while leaving the data software and services aspects as their own spin-off businesses. ARM's IoT business has seen quite a bit of success, with its technologies shipping on billions of devices and the planned goal of one trillion expected next decade. Hungarian autonomous driving startup AI Motive is leveraging its technology to address a different industry and growing need, autonomous satellite operation. 
AI Motive is teaming up with C3S, a supplier of satellite and space-based technologies, to develop a hardware platform for performing AI operations on board satellites. Their AI-Ware Neural Network Accelerator will be optimized by C3S for use on satellites, which have a set of operating conditions that in many ways resembles those on board cars on the road, but with more stringent requirements in terms of power management and environmental operating hazards. The goal of the team-up is to have AI Motive's technology working on satellites that are actually operational in orbit by the second half of next year. The projected applications of onboard neural, onboard neural network acceleration extend to a number of different functions according to the companies, including telecommunications, earth imaging and observation, autonomously docking satellites with other spacecraft, deep space mining, and more. While it's true that most satellites operate essentially in an automated fashion already, meaning they're not generally manually flown at every given moment, true neural network-based onboard AI would provide them with much more autonomy when it comes to performing tasks like imaging a specific area or looking for specific markers in ground or space-based targets. Also, AI Motive and C3S believe that local processing of data has the potential to be a significant game changer when it comes to the satellite business. Currently, most of the processing of data collected by satellites is done after the raw information is transmitted to ground stations. That can actually result in a lot of lag time between data collection and delivery of processed data to customers, particularly when the satellite operator or, or another uh, go-between is acting as the processor on behalf of the client rather than just delivering raw info. There is also more value from a business perspective in selling processed data ready to be consumed. AI Motive's tech could mean that processing happens locally on the satellite where the information is captured. Single board computers and other disruptive tech have shifted toward this kind of computing at the edge in ground-based IoT setups, and it only makes sense to replicate that in space for many of the same reasons, including reducing the time it takes to deliver the process data, which in turn means more responsive service for paying customers. The latest experimental addition to the Chrome browser promises to save a ton of power usage. A new flag in the Canary version of Chrome called Throttle JavaScript Timers in Background will cut down on the processing that normally happens in background tabs, and it could add two hours to a laptop's runtime. JavaScript's timers often track user interaction with a web page, checking things like the scroll position and add interaction while the tab is open. This also happens on background tabs, which really isn't useful since by definition a background tab isn't being interacted with. When you have a bunch of tabs open, these timers can chew through a good amount of battery for no reason. Normally, background tabs can trigger a wake up once per second. Now, in Canary, if you turn on the new Throttle JavaScript Timer setting, any tab that has been in the background for more than five minutes will have these timers disabled, with wake-ups limited to once per minute. Google ran, some to, uh, sorry, Google ran some tests to see what kind of impact this would have on battery life. For the first test, they used a 2018 15-inch MacBook Pro and loaded up 36 background tabs with a blank foreground tab, then let the laptop run until it died. With the feature turned on, the laptop lasted 2 hours longer, or 28% longer, than the default settings. That's a huge improvement, and it still can't get, but it still can't get Chrome up to the level of Apple's Safari, which bested Chrome by three hours with the default settings and by one hour with the new throttling flag. The first test showed just how much power can be sucked up by background tabs, but the next test was more of a real world use case. It swapped out of the blank foreground tab for a YouTube video. With an actual foreground task going on, the difference was less dramatic, but still significant. Without throttling tabs, Chrome lasted 4.7 hours, and with throttling, it got an extra 39 minutes, lasting 5.3 hours. Safari was not included in the second test. While these are promising results, Google says they are still investigating how limiting background timers will affect web pages. While Google says that the work done from these JavaScript timers was often not valuable to the user when the page was in the background, 
They also don't want to break web pages, which provide valuable background services like incoming chat and video messages, media playback, and notifications. After a 50% rollout on the Canary version, Google plans to gather feedback from web developers before the change hits the wider Chrome user base. You know, that's an interesting story because for my wife and I, who are both Chrome users, um, we often have a ton of tabs open. I mean, yeah. if I'm doing, you know, research for work or she's doing, you know, different things at home or we're helping the kids with school between their schoolwork and and the research that they're doing and the, the work that they're working on on their Google Docs, we could at any point have a couple dozen tabs open. And I mean, the, with my... Uh, with our family computer, we've got the dual monitors and it's not uncommon for me to have a browser off to the one screen with two dozen tabs and then my main screen where I've got a couple of main tabs. And so to to have, and, and granted it's not a laptop, but to have that power saving uh, is huge because not only is it less power on the computer that's being used, but over time you could see some savings in your... sure. You know, you mentioned it's not a laptop, and and one of the things that Becca didn't touch on, Jeff, was performance. Yeah, and I do think about how even on our desktop computer at home, my youngest will have that same scenario: twenty tabs open, mm -hmm. and then he'll switch user. Oh, right. So, which is great because Linux Mint allows us to have multiple people logged in at once. But now we've got somebody else logging in and got double hit, the taps. Yeah. So his Java JavaScript timers are still going off mm -hmm. in his browser on his profile. Yes. So I wonder how it would affect performance as well. Yeah. I, I I'm, I'm very it. interested to see. I mean, I, I know it's a small change yeah. going from one second to the one minute, but I'm really looking forward to see the impact because it, I, I do think it's going to be, uh, it will have that, you know, performance power, but, and especially for older devices. Uh, like if, you, sure if you've got an older laptop that's already struggling, I mean, not just battery saving, but if it does improve some of that background performance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that could breathe, you know, a little bit of extra life into those devices. Good so, thoughts. I think it's a great, great idea. Great feature. Yeah, totally agree. User profiles along with parental controls are finally available for Amazon Prime Video and Sega's next retro uh, hardware is a 1 6 scale multi-game arcade cabinet. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert is here with the Crypto Corner, so don't go anywhere. Welcome to the world of cryptos and welcome to the Crypto Corner. This week we had, uh, again, a stable market, uh, not, not huge change in the overall market cap. So from 266 billion, we went up to 272 billion. But again, if we saw it after those seven days, we'll see some significant changes like here V chain went up by 75% in just seven days. Or well, Aves 57%. In total, we have got over uh, 30 coins that went higher than 15%. And on the downside, we've got only four coins that lost more than 15%. So some interesting dynamic happening in this market, uh, as usual, of course. Now, this week I attended the Cardano Summit. And when you attend the summit, then this is how it will look like, because it has to be virtual. Uh, <clears throat> you have got the tracks where you can go and listen to the presentations. You have got the exhibit, uh, exhibition halls where you can go and uh, even talk to exhibitors. They have got some people on the other side of the computer and you can interact with them. And then the agenda. And this is um, something interesting in regards to Cardano because it highlights the difference between something like, like uh, Ethereum and Cardano. You, Cardano, as you can see here, is full of uh, academic people that did the presentations. And, um, and in... You see, doctor, 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 professor, and so on. And Ethereum is is more the environment of geeks, so uh, fantastic programmers, world best programmers that are coding on the Ethereum blockchain and coming up with new ideas of what to do, like the DeFi market uh, just uh, is a late uh, development. 
And in Cardano, they're coming from another a angle. They're coming from the intellectual angle, from the, theor the theoretical angle. And that's why also it took them much longer to go live uh, rather than um, like Ethereum. They went live very quickly in that sense. So it's interesting to see which one of those two blockchains will have the upper hand uh, long term. Now, <clears throat> going into detail of what has happened, I want to show you some presentations that I really liked. The, this one here is called Beef Chain, which is a supply management uh, or supply chain management uh, protocol together with uh, a legislator from Wyoming. And it highlights the difficulties that exist in this market. Like here, if a salmonella breaks out in one of those factories, the recall can be really devastating. Yeah, Like here, Peanut Corporation of America, that company doesn't exist anymore because of the salmonella outbreak. And executives are, were handed 28 uh, uh, years of prison. And so it's important to really have an end-to-end -end, uh, tool that you can rely on, and that's what they developed on the Cardano blockchain. And I hope they, one day they will also do that on the medical side because I, I heard that 10% uh, of all medication that you can buy is uh, fake or substandard. And so such a tool would be fantastic also in the medical sector. Next is onboarding. So, um, I mean, in the Western world, we don't have huge uh, problems in getting access to banks or loans. In other countries, like here, this is Africa, for example, it looks completely different. But how do you do that? You need to make it in a way that it is secure. And that's exactly what they developed here with a project called Atala Prism. And it's a big deal because it simply will open up uh, opportunities like lending, payments, insurance, banking. Uh, so in total, they calculate over 400 billion globally um, in DeFi payments and in Africa that could benefit for, from such a tool. It's just to make sure that uh, you're in a secure way are able to access uh, these uh, finance tools uh, in this case. Yeah, so it's a f f fantastic uh, product for the unbanked. Next one is Cardano aims to be extremely decentralized. At the moment, it's a little bit decentralized. But if you want to have something very decentralized, then you need to offer also tools in regards to the governance. And they develop this year with um, on, on the Cardano uh, platform on how the governments look like. Uh, looks like it's uh, fantastic and it's well thought through, so it's worth taking a look at. Yeah, so how is the voting done? What can you do with your coins and so on? Then part of the decentralization will be also um, a fund. And as you remember, probably iFund, which was created by Apple to get uh, apps onto into the App Store. Cardano is doing a similar thing now. So they launched um, <coughs> a fund with over 30 million uh, US dollars uh, in it already uh, to fund developers coming up with new ideas. And it will be then the chain governance decides whether those developers will get those uh, grants or not. And they, uh, or they will also be linked to deliverables, which I find uh, fairly attractive. So that's a new way of, of governance of a company or in this case, a project. And the last one that I saw is also that Coinbase Custody, which is just a department of uh, Coinbase, will support uh, secure, stating, uh, uh, secure staking of the Cardano, the ADA uh, in future. So in total, some really interesting developments on the Cardano platform, which I found interesting because it will shape uh, the industry as we are in. So that's it from me uh, this week. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope uh, you learned something. And please let us know if you've got any questions. So thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency markets are ever-changing and always volatile, so you should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. At long last, Amazon Prime Video is catching up to competitors like Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Plus with, with a key feature, user profiles. The feature began rolling out in the mobile and set-top box versions of the Prime Video app beginning Tuesday. The feature allows multiple people sharing on Amazon Prime's Prime subscription to maintain separate watch histories and watch lists. 
Additionally, Amazon has made a distinction between user profiles for kids and profiles for adults with different rules. Users can configure up to six profiles in any mix of children's and adults pro adult profiles. All of this is rolling out immediately, but it will take time to reach all users. Multiple user profiles were supported in India and Africa previously, and they are only now making their way to the rest of the world, including the United States. The rollout brings Amazon closer to feature parity with uh, Netflix and other big streaming partners, players. The bulk of major apps in this space offered this feature, but there are some outliers who still don't, like CBS All Access. Some of those other streaming services offer robust parental controls, so Amazon is leaning into that with these changes as well. Individual profiles can be flagged as a kid's profile. That profile will only see recommendations or search results of TV shows and films that are age appropriate, 12 and under, and kids won't be able to make purchases. Amazon is including a number of other options for filtering content like this, including the ability to restrict content on a per device basis. Amazon is making these changes amidst rising competition. Disney Plus has seen massive growth in the recent months and Netflix seems to be faring well also. Large new entrants to the market with massive libraries of exclusive content like HBO Max and Peacock are also hitting the scene, which puts pressure on Prime Video to offer competitive features and content. In terms of content, Amazon is working on a Lord of Rings TV series and it just released a new season of Hannah. The industry giant is also developing a TV series based on the video game franchise Fallout from some of the writers of Behind HBO's from some of the writers behind HBO's Westworld. What I do like about Amazon Prime Video is as an Amazon Prime member, I have it. Right. So while it, it kind of seems like, okay, well, these, there's all these services. You've got to subscribe to 10 different services in order to get the shows that you want. Well, Amazon Prime is part of my Prime service, right. which I get for free shipping. Yes. And priorities and, and stuff like that on Amazon. So it, it really is cool. What I don't like about the profile system on Netflix because there was a time when even Netflix didn't support profiles. Yeah, it's relatively new with like the last six months to a year, isn't it? Uh, it's been a couple years, Is I it? think, Jeff. Yeah, oh, I remember okay. reporting on it when it was new. But what I don't like about it is that there are no pins. There are no, right. there's no protection on the profiles. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. When I first set up profiles on our family Netflix account, I had one for each of my children and then one called parents. Right. And I had it set up so that it was like adult con like not adult content, but you know what I mean, grown-up shows. Yes. Uh for uh the parents and the kids were limited to stuff that was age appropriate. Well, it didn't take long before I started hearing from our our child that Oh, so and so changed my name to Butthead. <laughs> you know, and oh, they changed my avatar to something like whatever. So, it, and then it became yeah. like fights. Truth moment. That was you doing it at night, wasn't it? Nah, Just you got about. me. <laughs> yeah. No, so now it's like our our pro. I've given up. Our profiles are all ridiculous. Yes. But I, I really wish that Netflix and Amazon Prime maybe they'll maybe someone will clue in and say, okay, well. The parents should be the only ones who can set those settings. Yes. The parents should be the ones who can configure them. And maybe they, they have a pin-based system so that my, like each child could make changes to their own profile, like changing their avatar, changing their name, but not allow trolling right. <laughs> within the family. Yeah. So that's the only biff that I have with it. It's it's a nice feature that, uh, that they're rolling out with because... Um, that's been one of the challenges we've had. Like we have a, we have an Android box at home for the purpose of being able to get Disney Plus and Amazon uh, Prime TV on our home TV because it's not a smart TV or anything like that. So we needed a way to put all those kind of in there. Mm. And, um, and and one of the things that I've struggled with is whenever we've gone to Amazon uh, – to watch their content, there is no way to separate between the kids and the, yes. and the adults. And so this is a nice feature they're rolling out. But up until this point, I've not allowed our kids to go on to the Amazon content because right. I don't want them just opening up something and being like, Oh, that's, that's different. <laughs> yeah. Or there's the other side of it where, okay, well, each of the three kids is watching the office, but they're watching it at 
different places. Right. Right. It messes up the queuing. So yeah. So one of the nice things about online content and streaming video is that you can keep track of which episode you're on. Well, you lose that if you don't have profiles. Yes. So that's another thought. Yeah. All right. We've got a throwback to Becca. After the release of the Genesis Mini and the recent announcement of the Game Gear Mini, Sega doesn't show any signs of slowing down its plans for miniature retro hardware releases. The company's next entry in the space is the newly announced Astro City Mini, a tiny arcade cabinet set to sport 36 Sega arcade titles. First released to Japanese arcades in 1993, Sega's Astro City was a successor to the smaller 1988 Aero City cabinet. The Astro City Mini will launch by the end of 2020 in Japan for an asking price of 12,800 yen, which is roughly $119. The chassis itself will be at one sixth scale to an actual Astro City cabinet, standing a little more than six and a half inches tall. Based on this scale, this suggests that the original cabinet's 29 inch screen will be reduced to roughly 4.8 inches. The joystick and six button control, however, will be half scale. And that joystick will sport an eight way digital switch, which should be a huge improvement over the squishier analog joystick found on the Neo Geo Mini from 2018. Sega has announced 10 of the system's 36 games with more announcements planned throughout the summer. So far, the list contains Alien Storm, Virtua Fighter, Alien Syndrome, Golden Axe, Altered Beast, Columns 2, Dark Edge, Golden Axe, Revenge of Death Adder, Tant R, and Fantasy Zone. The unit will take micro USB power and will even support HDMI output to a big screen TV. It'll have basic emulation functionality such as save states. There will also be attachable USB control pads sold separately, which allow up to three people to play on the same mini cabinet. Any plans for release outside of Japan have yet to be announced. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Welcome back. Just a reminder that we are giving away a $25 gift card yeah, for Ameridroid.com. And so the way to win it is they have to like my tech story. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Email contest <laughs> at category5.tv. And when you do, just let us know that you're participating in the Ameridroid draw and uh, what you'd like to do with that 25 bucks. What would you do with it? What would I do with it? Hmm. That's a tough thing because I love so much stuff that Ameridroid has. Like I know. I think I'd probably put it toward a Raspberry Pi 4. Okay. And that would that would be a, a nice chunk toward it. I think that that would because a Raspberry Pi but then again, an XU4? Oh, I really love XU4s, Jeff. XU4s are nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would I think I'd have to just shop around. I I'd have to go through the the what they have. I know 25 wouldn't go very far with this purchase, but when Bo was here, yeah. he had that uh, tower case for the multiple single board computers. Yeah. I want one of those. Ooh. Because I have so many single board computers at home now that I'm actually, I'm starting to develop a massive board for in my, um, it's our laundry room, but where all like our, our router and all that yeah, kind of yeah. stuff is so that all my SBCs are oh, mounted cool. to it with yeah. all the cables running in. And I've got it hooked up to um, um, like a, a router uh, router box with six outputs. Yep. So I want something where I stick them all together. Oh, nice. That'd be nice. Yeah, that'd be cool. Very cool. What would you do? Email contest at category5.tv. Jeff, can you believe we're out of time? Time flies, man, and it's been it really nice having you here. We're like still finding our structure, finding our flow here at Category 5 TV since moving into the new studio space, yes. having to be socially distant. So Jeff and I are not able to physically interact. We've got a table here to like keep us from like high-fiving each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I love the fact that 
Is this our first episode in Studio E? Like you and I? You and I, yeah. Wow. You and me. Exciting. Yeah. Wow. I do like that. <laughs> I can't wait to see what the future has for Cat 5 in this studio because it was uh, it was an unexpected move, but it was an exciting move. And the potential of this studio is phenomenal. I mean, like uh, during the news there, you're like, hey, quickly run into the production studio. I did this. And, and, and hear the difference. Yeah. And it's true. It's silent in here. Yeah. But you go into the production studio and you hear that server rack. And I'm like, I completely forgot. Yeah. That was in Studio D. That used to be in the studio and we could like hear it. Like a foot from the camera. Yeah. Yeah. But not anymore. And so I'm really excited. Yeah. I'm a little bit sad that we can't do it with Sasha, yeah. but we miss Sasha. We do, yeah. But um, we're going to find ways, like we're working on ways to do like remote appearances and things like that. Plus, we've got the Category 5 Community Coffee Break, which is going really well. I'd encourage you to participate in that. We have, have that happen on Sundays, so um, that's going to be this Sunday at noon Eastern Time. Uh, if you'd like to join us, just go to our website, category5.tv, and scroll down. You'll find the information there. Yes. So, And Sasha occasionally pops in yes, on the she coffee does. break. I'm so. always busy at noon on Sundays. What? Well, I, it's That's just... it. We're moving it till 4 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I can, I can make that happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. All right, man. Well, that's, that's all the time that we have. So don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Category5TV. And of course, I am personally on Twitter at Robbie Ferguson, and I follow back. So please follow me. You can find our website at Category5.TV, where everything pulls together in one happy spot. So head on over there, Category5.TV. Been great having Jeff Weston here with me again this week. Great to have you back, man. I'm glad to be back. It's great to have you back. And we'll see you again next week. Take care. Bye. Thank you.